Thank you for listening to this message from River of Life Worship Center. We hope you were inspired, challenged, and blessed. If you would like more information about our church, visit our website at rolwc.net. So let's talk about fasting. I'm really excited, even though I may seem nervous. I'm excited uh, about calling the church to a fast because there may be some of you today and you have never fasted before. You have never heard it preached about. You've never, you don't even really know what it is other than skipping some meals and maybe losing some weight as we're all waiting for Saturday to come. So none of, some of us are not familiar with what it is and what it does, so it is going to be the beginning, I believe, of igniting growth in our life spiritually, whether you have fasted before or not. Because this is the truth, fasting and prayer go together. Fasting is not just something we do when your pastor calls you to a fast or you're in big trouble and you want to fast. It's not a 10-day, three-day, or the, 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 the all-consuming all, uh, um, 40-day fast. Fasting is something that really, and we're gonna see in a minute, should take place in our life, I would say, daily. Because fasting and prayer continually should go together. So hopefully, this is going to help us, this is going to enlighten us, this is going to strengthen us, because fasting will give us a discipline that in the future we can use to be a source of worship for us, a source of blessing, of guidance, of of answered prayer, of passion, of igniting something in our heart of growing us closer to the Lord. So in Matthew chapter six, Jesus addresses this subject in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it's interesting, almost invariably, anytime something significant happened in the Bible, it was preceded by prayer and fasting. So before the Israelites received the Ten Commandments, before Moses received the law that he was given to the people and it changed everything, he fasted and prayed. Before Nehemiah went to the king, he fasted. Before Israel received a king and and God was going to, to change some things in Israel, Samuel, the pastor of that nation, prayed and fasted. Before Jesus started his ministry, the Bible says he goes out and he prayed and he fasted. Before Paul and his associates went to build churches around Asia Minor and Rome, what did he do? He brought his team together and they prayed and fasted. And I believe this is one of those times in the life of River of Life, of our church, when we need to seek God's voice. We need to hear from God desperately in a direction that we need to go as a church. And it's it's exciting but we need to be, and my prayer is that we're on the same page, that we're in one accord, that, that we're in this thing together, and that we, we, we take what we're doing and we're taking it seriously and we're putting our all into it. I just want us to be in his will. I want us to be where he wants us to be in the time that he wants us to be in it. And as we're walking through this, not just for this week, but in the life of this church, I want us to enjoy the journey. I want us to, even if it's it's hard at times, because, because life is tough sometimes. And we have some great things in life that we're appreciative for what God is doing, but it's the journey that's special. It's the journey, and when more people are together on the journey, and we're in one accord, and we're helping and taking care of each other, and we have a passion and a goal, as we've seen in Acts chapter two, there is nothing that we cannot do when God is in it. And so it's critical as we look at this. There's something I want you to remember before uh, we get through this, and hopefully you'll, you'll write this down, you'll take this with you today, fasting focuses our motives on God's mission. That's, that's what we have to realize. Fasting, prayer, focuses our motives on God's mission. 
In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 17, 21. He said, you know what? There are some things corporately that take place in our own lives and he's speaking to the disciples and they're wondering, hey, how come, how come we went into a situation and there was maybe, in this case, there was a demonic force and we weren't able to do anything. We felt helpless. We felt paralyzed. We, 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 we felt it wasn't, we, 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 we were shackled. And Jesus said, listen, there are some things that happen in life, some things that you walk through that, that are going to take prayer and fasting in order for that answer to be revealed. There are some things as a church, when we are coming together corporately, when we are praying, when we are crying out to God, there are some things in our life, and we all have a purpose and a plan, but there's only some that are gonna happen through prayer and fasting. And that's why it's important to understand that prayer and fasting should be in the repertoire of our Christian walk. It's not something we do out of desperation. It's not something we just do once in a while. It's something that we need to understand what the Bible is talking about when it adds fasting constantly to prayer. So in Matthew chapter six, Jesus addresses three things that I want us to look at about fasting. The first is this when it comes to fasting. Our motives matter. When we fast, just like when we pray. What are, the motive of our prayer matters. Do you agree? Amen. So the motive of fasting and what we're fasting for, the motive matters because fasting focuses our motives on God's will, on what God wants, on hearing God's voice. So, so when it comes to fasting, we can find ourselves doing it for the wrong reasons. Let's look at the text and then we're gonna um, walk through it. Verse 16. And when you fast, Jesus said, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces. Their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So when we take a look at this first point, this first section in Matthew chapter 16, notice that, that Jesus says, and when you fast. He says that a number of times throughout the word of God, throughout the gospels. And Jesus is making the, the assumption that as Christians, not only do we have a passion to pray, but we have a passion and a desire to fast. That is, it is just part of our walk with God. But there is a discipline in our walk with God that a, at specific times, we are going to seek the Lord. We are going to fast. Maybe it, maybe it is one meal a day. Maybe it's one meal every other day. Where we're taking that time that we would normally eat and we're praying, we're seeking God, we're asking him for guidance, we're asking him for wisdom, we're asking him to show us things in the supernatural that we may, may not see in the natural. And it's becoming a part of our life. So Jesus says, and when you fast, when you pray, which is an ongoing thing in our relationship with God, so we don't hear this a lot or even talk about it, yet it is all throughout the Bible. In Matthew chapter nine, in verse 14, it says this, then the disciples of John came to Jesus, and here's what they said. Hey, why do we, which that was John the Baptist's uh, leadership team, and the Pharisees, who are the pastors of the day, how come they fast? In other words, it's a part of our life. But we're watching you and how you teach and how you lead and we're seeing your leadership team and there's no prayer, there's, we don't see fasting as a part of your life. What gives? Jesus said, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, I am God. I am with these guys 24 seven. They don't need to, to fast right now because, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. 
I am here. I am, I am the one who is guiding them. And watch what he says. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. What does that mean? There is going to come a day, Jesus prophesied, where I am going to die on the cross. I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to go and sit at the right hand of the Father. And when I am ascended into heaven, watch what he says. Then, when that happens, they will fast. It'll be a part of their life. They are going to pray. They are going to seek me. So this will be a part of their life. They are going to worship when I'm gone. They are going to be worshipers. So he gives us some guidelines in the way of a warning first. The first thing I want you to see in verse 16 is fasting needs to be sincere. And it goes back to our motive. He says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. So he's talking to them, and he's talking, when he says hypocrites, he's talking about the spiritual leaders of his day. They would mope around, they would act like they just got done running a marathon, and, 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 and they did it all for the purpose of letting everyone know that they were fasting. They did it for the reason of showing the people how spiritual they were, how strong they were, and how they were obeying the law, or how they were obeying what Christ was telling them to do. And here's what happened to them. Even though it may have started out well with the Pharisees and the spiritual leaders of the day, but over time with many of them, fasting, prayer, became a external motivation. Jesus even said about the leadership of the day, they come to me and they pray so loud, they pray, is there anything wrong with praying praying out loud? No, but it was the motive. And Jesus had to correct that. Now he's correcting this as well as fasting. So fasting became external in the motivation. So fasting is not done to impress others. It's not done to have a look who I am mentality. Did not John the Baptist say when he recognized God, he saw Jesus and he knew he was God. He knew he was the Messiah. He said this, okay, now I must decrease and and he must increase. He needs to be the one who everybody sees in me. He needs to be the one who gets the glory. He needs to be the one who gets the praise. So in Jesus' day, what would happen is they would put this oil on their skin. And so you read in verse 17 of Matthew 6, but you fast, but when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father in secret. And so what they would do, oil in those days was just like our deodorant. So hopefully when you got up this morning, you you hopefully brushed your hair, even though the messy look is in these days, and you brushed your teeth, and what was one of the things you did, if you, especially if you didn't take a shower in the morning, you would hopefully put on deodorant, right? You put on, I don't know, old baby oil, or you put on cologne or perfume, and you did that, why? So you wouldn't stink. So people, people knew that, that, that hey, they're, they're, they're refreshed, they're, they're, they're ready to go, and so in Jesus' day, what they would do when they fast, fasted is they wouldn't put any oil on. In other words, they walked out of the house every day without using deodorant. And time and time, day after day when this happened, quickly you would realize that they were fasting. And they wanted you to get their stench, their smell, so you would know that they were fasting. That was their motivation. Now, there are times when we are in a corporate fast, like I'm calling River of Life to do, and we are getting ready to do on Monday, where everyone is a part of it, and everyone knows the reason why we're fasting. So we're fasting to, as this new phase of our church, for direction, for wisdom, and you know that I'm fasting, and I know that you're fasting. So in in Esther chapter four, we also see that this is okay when it's done corporately because we see here, it talks about doing it in secret. We're gonna talk about that. But it's okay where everyone knows what everyone else is doing in this case of 
fasting. It's okay. Now, maybe you're hanging out with other people and they are Christians and maybe they don't go to this church and it come Wednesday, you hang out at their house and food is present and it looks really good and you are saying to yourself, should I eat? Should I do something here? Well, if the people that you are around, you know in their Christian walk, they're mature, then I would go ahead and tell them, hey, listen, I, I just want you to know we're fasting. Um, our church is fasting. We're on a personal fast. Hey, we're going to hang out and chill, but please don't be offended if, if I don't eat. And that's okay. Your, your motive is right. Are you following me? So if by chance, and, and you know what? That happened on Saturday morning when I went to the, the men's Bible study and Joe Fox was there and, and he's already fasting and praying and Ken made this big spread of, of, of chili, homemade chili and eggs and coffee and all this juice and everything there. And Joe said, oh my word, I'm fasting. You had to pick this day to do that. <laughs> and that's okay. So, so, so by chance, maybe if you felt that the people that you're with would not understand and they would think you're being haughty or they really, you know, you're just getting to know them and you're not sure where they stand, then what I would advise you to do is go ahead and eat and eat with them and don't say, don't say anything. Because the issue when it comes to fasting is it's done before God, not done to be seen by people. So the spiritual leaders were not interested in what people thought. They, they were not interested in what God thought. So their motives were wrong. And that's why fasting focuses our motives on God on his will, on his mission. And do you know what these men or people accomplished when all they wanted to do was show people and tell people how spiritual they were? They accomplished absolutely nothing. You look at verse 16, and it says this, that, that the fasting that they did when they did not um, give God the glory, their reward was when other people knew they were fasting. That was their reward. Their, their, their motive was to impress, and that's what they got. And listen, I want to encourage you as a church. We are in social media era. Don't go home and, and put on Facebook or social media, hey, I just want you to know our church, is, Dale called, our pastor called us to a fast. It's going to be amazing. I'm ready. I can't wait. I'm so excited. This is going to be great. God's going to do great things at River of Life. Hey, what's your church doing? Don't do that. Because then, we're, what is our motive in doing that? So we're, we're our corporately, where I'm asking you to fast, we don't need to be going out and telling everybody, you know, hey, here's what our church is doing because God's gonna do great things. Too bad your church isn't doing anything like this because maybe not great things are gonna, you guys are not spiritual enough. So let's not do that. So, as a church, together our hearts are ignited for one purpose, and that's to seek God's will. That's why our theme verse this year, Psalm 5110, is God igniting me a clean heart, restoring me a, a right spirit. So let's remember that verse as we walk through this week together and even beyond, because here's the deal. Fasting can readily lend itself to spiritual pride, and we have to be careful in that area. Well, there's a second thing I want you to see about fasting. <clears throat> you could say, hey, Dale, what is the big deal about fasting? What is its purpose? Well, the Bible gives us a variety of reasons we should take and why we should take this seriously. The first is this. We secure deliverance and favor from the Lord and from other people. When we fast, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1 it says this, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments within you, it goes back and says this in the verse that, that, that God is going to help us, that God is going to find favor in what we do and what we say. The Bible also talks in the book of Proverbs that how the king's hand and how God leads people and, and how they treat other people who are praying or that are seeking after God, that God will guide them, God will help them. There will be favor that is done there. So we need God's favor 
on September 10th. We need God's favor after that. We need God's favor in key decisions for the future of River of Life. And I'll tell you what, personally, I desire God's favor. And hopefully you do as well. So I desperately want to know his will and be content in his will, whatever his will is for me, whatever his will is for this church. Listen, we don't know how or when God is going to do what he will do, but we can begin to fast and we can begin to pray and we can begin to learn to be true worshipers. And he will reveal his work in us because fasting focuses our motives on God's mission. We see this in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter one, and, and, and he is so distraught because his hometown, is, his, his, his nation is destroyed, it's been ravished by war, and it's broken, and the people are broken. And, and it says this, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. This is what his servant tells him. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, Nehemiah said, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God in heaven. He is saying, God, I need to know your heart. I need to know your will. I want my motives to be right. There's, this is imp an impossible situation. He is under the authority of a king who does not serve the Lord. And so he is his servant. He is his cupbearer. And then you see in Nehemiah chapter 2 what happens. It says in verse 1, in the month of Nisan, Nisan in, in the 20th year of Xerxes, when wine was before him because he was the cupbearer, I took up wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This, this is nothing but sadness of heart, Nehemiah said. Then I was very much afraid because he cannot be sad in front of the king because the king doesn't want any people who are down. He wants to be lifted up, especially by his right-hand man. And he could have been killed for even being sad in the presence of the king. And so he says, and he, where does he get this boldness? from prayer and fasting. He says, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? And then he pours his heart out. When the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, its gates have been destroyed by fire. Watch what happens to the king's heart. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? And he says, listen, I want permission to go and build the city. And, and listen, I want you to pay for it. He says, listen, you, 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 even though that you conquered us, even though you destroyed us by war, even though we could be a threat to you and your kingdom, and the king allows Nehemiah to go and rebuild Jerusalem. It was an amazing, amazing miracle of God touching the heart. Why? Because of prayer and fasting and favor. In Esther chapter four, we see this again where again the nation is, is needing direction. And, and Esther told them to reply to Mordecai in Esther 4 and verse 15. And here's what she says, get all the people, get the church around and, and found that are in Susa and hold a fast, she says, on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days or nights. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. She says, uh, we need favor, so we need to pray, and we need to fast, and we need to do it together. Yes, we have done it individually in our life, but here's the situation where we want to come together, we need direction, we need favor. And she says, even though it is against the law for her to go to the king and ask anything, she says, I'm going to do it. And if I perish, I perish but we're gonna pray and we're gonna fast for favor. And she found favor. And the king dis was disposed towards her and her call and it delivered the people, it delivered the church, it delivered Israel. And church, when we seek the Lord, when we fast, we can have the favor and blessing of God in a way that we couldn't have any other way. 
Again, Jesus said, listen, there are times in life, there are some things, situations, decisions in the plan that I have for you, Jeremiah 29, 11, that are going to take fasting and prayer continually together. And it has to continue to happen in your life so I can show you and direct you and give you favor. That's why this needs to be a part of our life on a daily, ongoing basis. Prayer and fasting. And that's why I'm calling us as a church to corporately fast and pray because fasting focuses our motives on God's mission. And when that's our heart, we can have confidence that God will show us favor. Also, fasting assists us in seeking God's wisdom to bring alive his will in our life. In Acts chapter 13 and verse two, we studied this portion of scripture, but it says this, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So the leaders of the day, the disciples, the church, they're, they're, they're all praying together and God answers. God gives direction as they were seeking God's wisdom and they wanted to know what to do. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. So we are going to start fasting on Monday. We're gonna fast through Saturday. On Sunday at 10 o'clock, you are going to come. In fact, you're gonna come early. You're gonna be here at 945 because at 10, we're gonna start and we're going to pray, and we're going to pray over you, and then we're going to send you out. And we're going to have God's wisdom, and we're going to have God's favor. And God is going to do great things in our midst. Also in Acts 14, 23, it says, and when they had appointed leaders from them in every church, the church was growing. They were building churches. They had to have leadership in those churches. And what does the Bible say, they, what did they do? They committed themselves to prayer and fasting. I don't know how or when this is going to transpire for us to plant churches in our area. I don't know who the leadership team is going to be. I don't know who the worship pastor is going to be, who the pastor is going to be. Listen, That is not even important. The important part is we pray and fast and God is going to show us. God is going to direct us. He is going to tell us. But it's important that we do it together. When we're in one accord, where we know the vision, maybe there's other places that God wants us to go, that God wants, whether it's internationally or locally, I don't know. There's so many different types of models out there for church planting. And and over the last six, eight years, 10 years, I've studied so many of them and have been confused. What to do, how to do it, what model to use. I had to keep cutting it down because every year there's a new model. You go to all these church growth things and they give you this and give you that and listen, that's fine and I'm gonna take that in but I want God's model. I want what God wants to do. I hope you do too and so we have to pray and we have to fast because it's critical for us and for the direction of our church. Fasting focuses our motives on God's mission, not our, not our own. So church, when facing decisions, we need to know the mind and the will of God. We need to fast and pray, and it's when we get our own desires plus our own reasoning that really gets churches into trouble. And it gets us personally and families into trouble. Fasting helps us hear from God. When we pray and fast, when it's part of our life, it guides us every single day. It guides us, and we need God's direction daily, not just in a time of crisis. Sometimes we pray only in time of need, in time of crisis, in times of things we don't know how to handle, and and it makes our relationship with God unhealthy. So this is, a, this is a part of our everyday life. And so it's so important. You say, well, Dale, how long do I have to fast? How long do I have to pray to hear God's voice, to know direction? Well, we can go a lot of places in the Bible, but for the sake of time, let me bring you to Daniel chapter 10 and verse two. It says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. 
He's fasting. He's praying. He said, here's what I did. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. In other words, remember we talked about putting oil on your body so so you don't smell. For the full three weeks. So here he is. And he's, he's seeking after God. He's seeking direction. And then in verse 12, it says this. Then he said to me, the angel that came, fear not, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard and I have, become, and, and, and I have come because of your words. Wow. So that was encouraging to me. From the first day that Daniel started to fast and seek the Lord, the Bible said this, the answer's coming. Did Daniel know the answer was there or coming? No. But but from the first day, I mean, that is amazing. That fires me up. And as we begin this time of fasting and seeking the Lord, know this, that God is sending the answer. Isn't that so cool? He has already sent the answer. When that comes, I'm not sure. How it comes, I don't know. But when our heart is after seeking God, when our heart is sincere, when our motives are right, I don't know when we're going to receive the fullness of those answers, but on September 4th, September 5th, September 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, I can tell you this from the Bible, heaven will be listening. Heaven and will be listening. And that's amazing. Because, because fasting focuses our motives not on our will, not on what we want or we think should be done, but on God's heart and God's will. Then fasting serves as a point of repentance. Now, we don't get forgiveness through repentance, so I want to make sure that's clear. We do not get and receive forgiveness of sin through, repent, through fasting. But on more than one occasion, we see fasting associated with repentance. In 1 Samuel 7, 6, it says this, so they gathered at mitzvah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on, the day, on that day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. So so there was was sin in their hearts. They come before God. Samuel was the pastor of that day of the church there and he judged the people of Israel. He saw their hearts. But in this repentance, in this repentance, there was fasting. There was was prayer that went along with it. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, He began to repent before the Lord and call out to God. And as he repented, he fasted and he prayed. In fact, that's where we get our our theme verse in Psalm 51.10. David's the one who said, God, forgive me. God, I repent. Restore me. Ignite in me a clean heart. Restore in me a right spirit. God, there's been sin in my life. God, I know I disappointed you. I disappointed my family. I disappointed Israel. And God, forgive me. And so he prayed and he fasted. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 2, we see Daniel. And it says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the book's the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I turned my face to the Lord because the the whole church at that time was was serving their own self and, and Daniel begins to cry out to God and watch this, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting. So he's, he's, he's calling out for the repentance and for, for God's people to humble them, their heart, to turn towards God. And, it, and everything had to do with repentance there. So if this morning you're struggling with an area of spiritual weakness and you're a believer, you're a Christian, but you're struggling in, this, in an area of your life where you just can't seem to overcome, you can't seem to break it, Maybe it's, your, your, maybe it's gossiping. You just can't help it. You've asked and you've prayed, but you haven't taken it to this point of, of, of some things only happen when fasting is involved in, in, in our everyday life. 
Maybe it's a laziness, it's a slothfulness as a Christian. You just can't seem to, to get over that. Maybe it's, maybe it's with pornography. And you, can't just, you can't get over the hump. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's cursing your mouth. Every, you, you leave and, and your, your, your mouth is filthy with, with, with curse words, damning God and using other vulgar language. And you're a Christian. Maybe it's an area of tithing. And, and, and you just can't seem to, to make that sacrifice to give according to what the word of God says to do. And you can't break that pattern. Listen, fasting can help us get control, can help us with breakthrough. Another thing that happens is fasting brings humility. We see again in, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10 and verse 12, then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, the angel of the Lord, for from the first day you set your heart to understand, watch this, and humble yourself before the Lord. Pride was broken. There was a, there was a humility. In fact, in Psalm 35, 13, it says, but I, when they were sick, David said, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with my head bowed low on my chest. In other words, this, there's this humility. Whenever you look at fasting and prayer in the New Testament, there's this attitude of, of being humble, of knowing that, that God, the Holy Spirit, is the answer. And here is what takes place when we fast. We are bringing ourselves under the hand of the Lord. I know we don't like this word submission, but we are submitting to God's word. We are submitting to God's authority. You say, Dale, what do you mean? Our body, our mind, our desires come under his power, under his word, under his direction. And so through fasting and prayer, we're saying the spirit of God that is in me is going to control me. Because at salvation, the Bible says that the Spirit of God lives in us. Now, most of us, if we're honest, are totally controlled by our physical bodies. You hear a lot of preachers, or when we talk, we use the word flesh. That just means our own physical bodies. And we have to be overcomers of the flesh. Or, or, or how do we do that? We do that through prayer and fasting. But many times our physical bodies demand so much from us. When, we, when we're hungry, we eat. Sometimes when we're not hungry, we eat. Right, so, so when, 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 when we're tired, we sleep. When we're tired, we may feel tired, and we say, well, because my body's telling me I'm tired, and the alarm goes off to go to church on Sunday, or goes to church on, to, to do something for, for the Lord, you, have, you know that you're to do, and we say, you know what, my body's tired, I'm not gonna do it. Or when it comes to reading the word, or praying, or fasting, or, or God leading us in a direction. You know that God wants to do that, but your body says something different. Your body does not want to go that direction. And many times, here's what we think. Well, if I feel like it, I'm going to do it. If, 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 I, if, it, if it's my will, I'm doing it. If I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. And our physical body, our physical preferences many times wins out. But through fasting and prayer, what we are saying is, my conviction needs to override my emotion. And God, I need you to help me. I need you to strengthen me in church. When we humble ourselves, our spirit then begins to take control of the physical body. That's why fasting should not be done just in the first week of January. There's nothing wrong with that. But it shouldn't be, Dale, how come we're not doing a prayer and fasting for the first week of January? How come, how come when we're, you know, or, or we're just doing this, a fast when we need something? Again, it goes back to, that's the wrong motive. Fasting, when we pray, when we fast, it should be done continually. It should be a lifestyle. And, 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 and that will lead us to victory. Amen. You say, why? Because Fasting and prayer focuses our motives on God's direction, on God's will, on God's mission and what he wants. James tells us to humble ourselves and the Lord will exalt us. Well, we're almost done. Fasting gives us power and authority in the area of spiritual warfare. 
Again, in Matthew 17, 21, Jesus said, when it comes to warfare, when it comes to things you don't understand, some of these things, I'm going to give the answer, I'm going to help you figure this out, but it's going to take this lifestyle of prayer and fasting. Listen, life is a battle. I mean, it is assumed by me, this church, it was when we dove into this, this area of the book of Acts, when we talked about igniting something in our church, and even September 10th, that, that hell or the enemy was going to be paying attention. Because, listen, anything we do to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this is true, hell will be active. No matter what we do. If we sincerely are trying to advance the, 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 the gospel, hell is going to be active. It's real. Spiritual warfare is real. And, and you say, Dale, does that bother you? No, because I believe when we are ready, when we are prepared, we have the armor of God that we see in Ephesians chapter six. We're ready, we're confident, we're praying, we're fasting, we're in one accord. And when that happens, there really is nothing we can't do because Jesus Christ is in us. He's going before us. We're ready. We know what's gotta happen. We know the enemy is gotta be coming at us. And so Jesus said, I will then build my church. And, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail. They're going to come against, but they're not going to prevail. They're not going to win out, but we have to stand. We have to be prepared. And fasting and prayer is going to do that. That's why it's not a once or twice a year thing. It should be a constant thing. Fasting prepares us for new opportunities. We see that all throughout the word of God. I believe as we, we get a hold of this, we are going to see new ministry opportunities in this church and in our community and around the world that we don't even know are going to take place yet. Fasting gives us also an increased awareness of God's presence. God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. In other words, when we move our hearts and our attention towards God, his presence is increased around us. And we're aware of it. Even though he is always here. He never leaves. He never forsakes. But when our motives and our mind is in a right place, and fasting and prayer is a tool that awakens us to the presence of God, and we're doing it consistently. Not just again in need, even though we can do it when we're in need, but it's just part of us. Then, all of a sudden, his presence is increased. We're aware of it. So one aspect of this, prayer and fasting, is, is going to be this. When, let's say, you're praying, you're fasting, you're making a part of your life, the enemy is also gonna use things to, to throw us off base. So, this may happen to you. You created a great meal. You made homemade pasta sauce, and it was the best you ever made before. And meatballs and chicken in there and, and sausage, and it's 12 midnight, and you're hungry because you're fasting. You get up, you're awakened by hunger pains. Instead of praying, you go downstairs, you open the fridge, you heat up the sauce, you get some garlic bread, you turn on the TV, and you begin to watch ESPN and watch the scores around 12, 15, 12, 30 at night. <laughs> Just in case that happens to you, I'm not saying that that happened to me, but if, 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 if that happens, don't feel guilty because the enemy has automatically got to condemn you and say, you know what, Dale, you're a loser. You, you're trying to fast. You can't even do it for two days. Here you are, you already broke the fast, you're watching TV, you're supposed to be praying, you, you know, this is, this is horrific. So if that happens, know this, the enemy is gonna try to throw us off base. Now, we are going to try when we feel those hunger pains to be praying for direction, to be praying what God wants to do, and, and he is going to strengthen us. This is something, if we haven't added it, to our life, just like maybe we're living a Christian life without praying. 
Maybe our, our prayer is in the morning when we get up and at night before we go to bed and it's, it's a kind of prayer that says, now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayer. God has to grow us. And he's gonna grow us in this area of fasting. So we are going on a six-day fast and that's just a start. So unless you have a medical condition that doesn't allow you to fast, everyone here can afford to meal, miss a meal or two. It's not a diet. It's not a cleanse. Whatever, you know, people are all into cleansing now, cleansing their bodies. Fasting, it's fasting and praying. They go together. So will missing a meal really do anything in your spiritual life? I want to challenge you to find out. I want to challenge you. Because some people think, well, it's just a meal. Listen, when you're praying and fasting, God's going to do something. And here we're going to close with the payoff. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 17. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not seem by others, but by your Father who is in secret. Watch this. And your Father who sees your heart will reward you. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse eight says this. This is after they broke their fast, the nation, the church. It says, then, your, your, you, then shall your light break forth like dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you should call and the Lord will answer. He will hear your cry and say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness. In other words, what you did before the fast, you leave that behind and you look forward. You look ahead. And this is what God is wanting to do. Listen, God will reward you. God will reward us. And, and I want to encourage you that God is going to understand as you walk through this especially if this is new, especially this is the first time you've heard that, you mean fasting is supposed to be a part of my everyday life as a Christian? Yes. 